Hi guys. Um, so this one and then the next lecture, um, I'm sorry you get to see the corner of my living room. I am gone on um, vacation um, this week and then next week I will be getting back from vacation so I wanted to make sure that you guys had everything you needed to get started. Um, I apologize I look like a disheveled mess. I just finished teaching dance. <laughs> All right. Um, so we are still in um, the theater history portion. This is chapter 12. If you have the book, Reinterpretations, Europe Rediscovers the Western Classics. I am going to try and breeze through this, but man, with theater history, there's just, there's so much information to cover. And it's, it's really good. It's really interesting. But all right. Um, I'm sorry if I'm squinting here. It's trying to make sure you can see me, but I can see the book. All right. Following a few precedents in non-dramatic literature, by the 16th century, European artists and scholars were seriously revisiting classical thought in playwriting and theatrical practice. Europeans at this time had little or no awareness of the Asian theatrical forms. Serious melding of East and West in theater would not occur until the late 19th century. For some 200 years or more, however, Europeans rejected med medieval thought and practice and attempted to create a new classism inspired by what they could learn about the Greeks and Romans. After remarkable experiments in Italy, England, Spain, and France, the European theater settled into a, new, a nearly uniform approach to theatrical practice and dramaturgy. This uniformity in plays, at least, is usually called neoclassism a systematic approach to playwriting based on interpretations of classical Greek and Roman models of plays and theory. So we talked about the Italian Renaissance. Between the Japanese eras of Zimi and Chikamatsu, Italy launched its renaissance of art and literature. This rebirth of classically inspired creativity produced few plays that are still revived, but Italy's contributions to the theater between about 1500 and 1700 were enduring achievements. Of course, Italian art looked back to the humanistic art, literature, and philosophy of the Greeks and Romans. This ferment at court and in the academies led directly to the Italian inventions of perspective painting of scenery and easily changeable scenery for the stage. Italians also invented the proscenium arch, or the picture frame theater. t -Pack, they, you know, um, the Johnson Theater, the Polk Theater, they, they both have that. Italians also invented the, uh, I just read that, proscenium arch, uh, picture frame theater, and because Italian theater moved indoors, theater standardized artificial illumination using candles and oil lamps. The Italians created opera as an attempt to understand and reconceive Greek tragedy, developed neoclassical principles for the writing of plays, and launched the vibrant, imp vibrant improvisational Commedia dell'arte. Perspective scenery for plays appeared as early as 1508, and standardized approaches to such scenery were pop. Um, popularized in the designs and writings of Sebastiano Serlio in 1545. Although Serlio and others experimented with a variety of methods for transferring per, um, perspective to the stage, the standard became two-dimensional changeable wings or flats that could be pulled quickly on and off stage in grooves on the floor and at the top of the tall wings. So I think we all know this, but you cannot build scenery like you build a house. Um, it cannot be that heavy. It cannot be that concrete. It, it basically needs to do what it needs to do. And in this case, um, it was just backdrops. So they were literally like boards and you could just move them or they could slide. Um, but they hadn't had scenery like this um, since then. Remember, um, most of them, especially like at the Globe and stuff, the, the stage was very bare. It was just all about the actors. Um, Italian at scenery was at first presented on platforms and halls without any kind of framing. After experiments with temporary prosceniums, new theaters dedicated to court entertainments, opera and theater begin to appear with permanent frames separating the audience from the scenery. The oldest proscenium theater surviving to the 20th century, reconstructed after being destroyed in World War II, is the Teatro Farnese in Parma, which was designed by Eliodi in 1618. Italian neoclassicism began to develop early in the 1500s, and by the late 1600s, it was standard practice throughout the Western world and remained so until the early 19th century. Although playwrights from other countries wrote more significant plays using neoclassicism, the system was developed by Italian playwrights and theorists. 
Once established, neoclassism no longer needed to justify its existence, but the standards became rather inflexible rules against which the Romantics finally rebelled in the late 1700s. Three basic tenets were central to neoclassism. Reality, morality, and universa uh, yeah, universality. Reality did not mean realism, but what the Italians called verisimilitude which established that theatrical events as written and staged should be reality-based, events that could really occur in life. Some aspects of verisimilitude were drawn from the classics, some were not, and what often seemed a tendency in Greek and Roman plays became rules for the neoclassists. The three unities, for example, can be found in some of the classics, but were by no means rules in Greece. These were the unity of time, that the action of the play should take place in 24 hours or less, uni unity of place, action should occur in one location, and the unity of action, no subplots unless fully integrated with the central conflict. One of the most entertaining Italian comedies, um, Niccolo Machiavelli's The Mandragola, uh, in 1520, for example, takes place on a street in front of several houses in Florence. The events of the play span one day and night. All the action is geared to an intrepid young man's successful seduction of a young wife and his trickery at the expense of her credulous old husband. The unities were meant to enhance believability of the action and scenic presentation while unifying the artistic integrity of the play. The pursuit of reality also led to avoiding onstage violence and supernatural events. No one would believe them or accept them, it was thought. Neoclassism also demanded that plays should teach a moral lesson. At first to help justify secular subjects and receive the sanction of church and political authorities. Sometimes the moral lesson was stated at the conclusion of the play or it was nearly implied throughout. Typically the conclusion states the importance of not... Um, I need my glasses. Foiling true love, the rewards of remaining virtuous or the idea that peace and human understanding only come after significant suffering. The early Mandragola did not follow this rule, but most Italian plays did. The neoclassists also strove for an idealism and universality in morality and characterization, which led to much stereotyping of character. Known as decorum, this universality of character led playwrights to draw characters according to current notions of appropriate behavior, values, and language in terms of age, sex, social class, occupation, and economic condition. When not working with fully scripted plays, the Italians ventured far from the restrictions of neoclassism. Professional Italian commedia dell'arte, or improvisational comedy, also became an international phenomenon whose import outlasted neoclassism, but comedia's origins are less certain. It appears that by the mid-1500s, popular professional commedia companies were performing throughout Italy and, had, and some had moved to other countries such as France by 1548. Because of similarities in character types, scenarios, and styles, some historians surmise that commedia had its origins in the Greek and Roman mimes. Many characters wore masks, for example, the servant clowns or zanni, such as um, Arlecchino and Brighella carried out foolishness and intrigues against ridiculous older matter, uh, masters such as Pantalone, a miser, and Capitano, a braggart soldier. But many unmasked characters were central to the action. Actresses played actresses played unmasked types such as the leading lady, the prima donna, and young lover, Inamorata, supposedly to reveal the beauty of the actresses. Of course, young male lovers in a Murato were also unmasked for similar reasons. Commedia dell'arte predated and worked outside the conventions of neoclassism until the mid 1700s, when neoclassical playwrights in Italy and France convinced many commedia actors to start performing fully scripted plays, eliminate masks, and soften the broad humor. This neoclassized commedia spelled the end for commedia as continuing improvisational and farcical acting style. All right, Elizabethan England. So that was Italy, this is Elizabethan England. Beyond doubt, the period of theater history that tends to fascinate most contemporary Western theater goers is that of William Shakespeare, who is usually lionized as the preeminent playwright of the English language, if not the world. Whether his importance is exaggerated or not, he is clearly the most famous playwright of Western civilization. What other playwrights can claim, so many theater festivals dedicated to them. 
uh, who does not know about Hamlet, even if he or she has never read the play. Although most t people today view the Elizabethan period of theater through Shakespeare's works, Shakespeare's fellow Elizabethans would not have done so. This period of greatness in English theater took place between 1587 and 1642, a short era that coincided with British exploration, conquest, and nationalistic fervor. During the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, professional theater in London forged a union between acting companies and a host of writers, mostly university educated. The English at first showed little interest in Italian neoclassism or changeable scenery, although they would adopt both in 1600. I'm sorry, 1660. Instead, the actors performed in three-story polygonal public theaters that were open to the sky. All action transpired on a thrust stage, fronting a facade with probably two doors and sometimes a curtain discovery space between them. The most famous of these structures was the Globe Theater created by Shakespeare's company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men, who were led by actor-manager Richard Burbage. The companies doubled many roles and performed with a rolling repertory, a system of daily changes of plays. With more than 30 plays a year, a popular play reappeared throughout the season. Most of these plays were written in blank verse, unrhymed iambic pentameter, but the playwrights also made extensive use of prose and rhymed verse, which were often mixed with the blank verse as a home base. Elizabethan drama is typically marked as beginning with Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy in 1587, a study in vengeance, madness, and grotesque onstage violence, which long stood as a model of tragedy of revenge. Christopher Marlowe was the first to master blank verse, and he created significant models of heroic, anti-heroic, and historical tragedy. His Dr. Faustus in 1588 was the first important play on the reoccurring subject of selling one's soul to the devil. Edward II in 1592 was the first important chronicle, a dramatic adaption of historical events dealing with kings and frequent struggles for the crown of a, disposed, of a deposed king. Tamburlaine in 1587 was apparently the first play whose popularity inspired a sequel, Tamburlaine II, um, in 1588. We have been suffering with sequels ever since. Most of Marlowe's tragic heroes were first performed by Edward Allen, the leading, the leading actor of the Admiral's Men, Richard Burbage's chief competition. About the time Marlowe was murdered at the age of 29, Shakespeare's playwriting career was catching fire. Hmm wonder if there's some connection there. Unlike Marlowe, Shakespeare was an actor and was not educated at a university. He fully understood the company for which he was writing and must have performed some of the roles himself. Most of Shakespeare's tragic heroes were first performed by Burbage. Also, unlike Marlowe, who specialized in tragedy, Shakespeare created masterpieces in nearly every major dramatic form of the era. From situation comedies such as Comedy of Errors in 1593, to romantic comedy such as Much Ado About Nothing in 1598, to fantastic comedy of the supernatural such as A Midsummer Night's Dream in 1595. Shakespeare created lasting renderings of romance, foibles, and mistakes in both the seen and unseen world. The one popular type of play that Shakespeare did not master became the specialty of Ben Jonson, another actor-playwright who created some of the most biting satire of his time, and sometimes got in trouble with the authorities for his barbed tongue. His Volpone in 1606 creates a comic villain surrounded by fools and a manipulator so masterful that he cannot be overthrown except by himself. He must ridiculously overreach to be overwhelmed by the wheel of fortune, the notion that fortune changes if we wait long enough. In fact, most of humanity in Johnson's plays, such as The Alchemist in 1610, and Every Man in His Humor in 1598 is shown as foolish, stupid, and easily duped. Recalling the Greek Aristophanes, Johnson was an acidic commentator on his times. After the death of Queen Elizabeth in 1603 and the ascension of James I, many playwrights created plays filled with terror and a host of malcontents. Similar to today's horror movies, The Duchess of Malphi in 1613 by John Webster and The Revenger's Tra Tragedy in 1606 by um, Cyril Turner, created a pessimistic tone with sensational scenes of torture, poisoning, strangulation, sword fights, and runaway vengeance. Officially, this remarkable peri period ended with the closing of the theaters in 1642, at the outbreak of a horrendous political and religious civil war. 
For 18 years of Puritan control, there was no monarch, theaters were dismantled, acting companies were outlawed, and aside from a few underground performances, public theater in England was dead. The Spanish Golden Age. So we've talked about Italy, we've talked about England, and we've ta we're now talking about the Spanish Golden Age. Developing simultaneously with but independent of the Elizabethan theater, Spain's professional theater entered what is called a Golden Age that lasted from 1580 to 1680. Professional actors had been working for some time before 1580, however, in both religious and secular plays, with companies made up of both men and women, the actors performed in temporary spaces, often courtyards, until professional public theaters were built in Madrid, Seville, and elsewhere beginning in 1579. The public theater, called a corral, resembled the Elizabethan public theater as uh, in many ways, a raised roofed stage backed by a, a facade with doors and a discovery space, a second balcony level, and three levels of galleries and boxes for the audience, and a pit or a patio for standees open to the sky. The most distinct difference from the Elizabethan theater, however, was a segregated seating area for unmarried or unaccompanied women. Called the cazuela at the back of the house, facing the stage, the existence of the cazuela was itself ironic since actresses were performing on the stage. The history of theater is littered with contradictions. Lope de Vega was one of the most wildly popular playwrights in theater history. He wrote hundreds of plays and his fan following could easily be compared to more recent pop phenomena such as the intense popularity of the Beatles, Star Wars, and the Harry Potter books. When he died in 1635, one theater staged, um, staged uh, a play in which an actor playing Lope ascended into heaven like a saint. Most of his plays explore the very complex Spanish code of honor and feature love affairs, intrigues, awful villains, and restoration of honor after many tribulations experienced by the hero and heroine. Lope's most intriguing play might be Fuente Ovejuna in 16... 14, which features a collective, hero, a collective hero, all the inhabitants of the village, who rise up against their evil overlord and kill him after he rapes and tortures an innocent village woman. No one among the brave and steadfast villagers will name a killer even when tortured severely by the authorities. Their only answer, even on the rack, is the name of their village, Fuente Oveuna. Overlapping Lope's career was that of another prolific and remarkable com um, comedy and tragedy playwright, Calderon de la Barca, who also explored the love and honor themes and was equally fascinated by philosophical questions. The Constant Prince in 1635 is a disturbing examination of self-sacrifice in which a prince captured in war refuses to allow himself to be ransomed. Um, Calderon's most famous play, Life is a Dream in 1636, explores illusion versus reality through the struggles of a prince who from birth has been kept imprisoned and ignorant of any social activity until he is grown. When released into the world as a prince once more, he believes that he is in a dream and not surprisingly often reacts with comic misunderstanding and deadly savagery. After the death of Calderon in 1681, the professional theater continued, but no more great playwrights emerged for centuries. Stage censor censorship after 1680 in Spain became quite severe. After the Golden Age, Spain, like England, after its civil war, adopted neoclassism. 17th century, France. While England and Spain were exploding with vibrant theatrical activity at the end of the 1500s, France was still struggling to find an artistic identity. Throughout the guidance and patronage of Cardinal Richelieu, the Prime Minister under Louis VIII, however, theater and drama found prominent voices in the 1620s and well beyond. Avoiding the style of their enemy, England, French theorists, artists, and playwrights found themselves attracted to the neoclassical model of drama and the Italian models in theater and scenic design. They endeavored to out-Italian the Italians, and in playwriting, at least, they were quite successful in their quest, so much so that many artists and scholars by the mid-18th century began to identify neoclassism with the French instead of the Italians. The French were also attracted to Commedia dell'arte, whose methods were especially influential on the development of French comedy after a comedy troupe took up residence in Paris in 1548. In the same year, Europe's first new theater since the Roman Empire was built in Paris. The new Hotel de Bourgogne 
eventually became the first home of French professional theater companies. By 1641, Paris got its first proscenium theater, the Palais Cardinal, built in the Palace of Cardinal Richelieu. After his death, it became known as the Palace or Palais Royal and was ultimately the theater of Moliere, the premier actor and comic playwright of the era. Other theaters also quickly added proscenium arches, which became the European standard. Neoclassicism did not triumph in France without a bit of a fight, however. Pierre Corneille, Corneille yeah, was the first of three great playwrights of 17th century France. He tested the waters of neoclassicism in 1636 by writing and producing The Cid, a fascinating tragicomic tale inspired by Spanish history and drama. Um, the newly formed French Academy created, uh, nope, I underlined that and then I guess I thought it wasn't important. Going on. Um, Jean Racine remains the most revered writer of tragedy in all of French theater. He reworked famous plays and stories from Greek and Roman originals and in several cases produced the most profound versions. His tragic verse was written in rhyming couplets, making translation into English a monumental task. At the center of his plays is always a psychological struggle in which the protagonist, usually a woman, is given an impossible choice, a lose-lose situation. She is torn between her desire and her duty, and desire always wins. Sorry, Molly is sniffing things. Um, in our own time, it is the comedies of Moliere from this period that are most frequently revived and studied. Unlike Corne um, Corneille and Racine, Moliere was also an actor and the manager of his theater company, the most successful in Paris. Moliere wrote farces and comedies of manners, depicting and satire, uh, satirizing upper-class society, but many of his plays featured eccentric central characters who are given to access such as miserliness and hypochondria. Tartuffe, in 1669, is a satirical study in religious hypocrisy. Moliere often took the leading male roles himself, and late in his career, his talented young actress wife, Armand Bijart, often took the female leads. Hi, Moss. The success of both Moliere and his company was so great that when he died suddenly in 1673, the Parisian theatrical world was thrown into a tizzy, such that uh, such as that sparked by our contemporary corporate rating and scandals in the business world. The Crown interceded and forced three professional theaters to combine. The new company was called the Comédie Francois, and for many years it exercised a monopoly on drama in Paris. Although the monopoly is long gone, the Comédie Francois continues still and considers itself the house of Molière. Restoration England, so after Elizabethan England. <clears throat> when the monarchy was restored in England in 1660, the theater was also revived after an 18-year absence. For the new actors, playwrights, and managers, the influence of France was more prominent than the memory of Elizabethan theater practice. Many royalists loyal to the king had lived in exile in France along with the new king, Charles II. They became close to the French court and very conversant with professional theater, which then featured actresses, Italian at scenery, and the neoclassical plays of Corneille and Moliere. Once back in England, Charles II granted patents, or official licenses, to new theater managers to open professional theaters. Most theater buildings had been demolished by the Puritans, and performance spaces had to be adapted from existing buildings, such as indoor tennis courts. One new theater, once new theaters could be built, they featured proscenium arches and changeable scenery. Also, in 1660, the professional theaters introduced actresses to the English-speaking stage. This novelty soon became the standard, and the second generation of actresses, including very talented performers such as Anne Bracegirdle and Elizabeth Berry, who inspired playwrights to create roles specifically for them. The new actresses were the first women to play Shakespeare's famous female roles such as Juliet, Ophelia, and Desdemona, all of which had originally been played by boys or young men. A great male actor, Thomas Betterton, also appeared in the Restoration and created a tradition for performing Shakespeare's leading men that influenced a long line of classical actors stretching to our own time with the likes of John Gilgald, Alec Guinness, and Ian McKellen. Betterton also specialized in the comedy of manners. The comedy of manners reached a kind of perfection in the Restoration as upper-class characters were caught in a comic struggle between their own personal desires and prevailing social co codes of behavior. 
In these plays, the most clever and intelligent people who could manage to control their emotions were always victorious over those who revealed their emotions too easily. The Restoration Period is also noteworthy for the, the earliest known plays written by professional women, women playwrights. Aphra Ben's intrigue comedies have found new audiences in our own time, especially her delightful romp, The Rover, in 1677, the original production of which featured Elizabeth Berry and Thomas Betterton. This play of chases and disguises was so successful that it led to a sequel. Although British playwrights had embraced neoclassism by 1660, they did so with a few variations that persisted until the Romantic Rebellion at the end of the 18th century. For the British, unity of place was defined not as a single location, as the French and Italians defined it, but as any set of locations that could be reached within a 24-hour period. Consequently, the British had many changes of scene in the traditional genres, unlike the French and Italians. The British also maintained violence on the stage with numerous sword fights, which their audience seemed to admire, but the French strictly avoided. Otherwise, the British stage was very neoclassical for about 150 years. The Restoration period, however, lasted a mere 40 years. After 1700, new plays in England and its colonies moved towards sentimentality, eliminated obvious sexual scenes and comedies, and more stringently followed the principle of teaching moral lessons. In 18th century Europe and the Americas. When looking back on 18th century Western theater now, we are often struck by similarities from country to country in terms of dramatic style, acting methods, theater architecture, and scenic design. Of course, the subject matter and language of plays often differ dynamically, but nearly all plays follow the principles of neoclassism. The plays of the 18th century that tend to be revived in our own period are comedies of manners, some of which enjoy popularity, especially in resident, professional, and university theaters. From England, Oliver Goldsmith's She Stoops to Conquer in 1773 and Richard Brinsley Sheridan's The School for Scandal in 1777 have held the English-speaking stage since their creation. They continue to entertain audience members who still recognize incisive social criticism, duplicity of character, the dangers of gossip, and misguided attempts of elders to force their intentions on grown children. Italy produced entertaining comedies through the efforts of Carlo Goldoni, whose reforms brought Commedia dell'arte to an essential end by fully scripting plays for the Italian actors, beginning with the farce, the servant of two masters, um, in 1743. Goldoni eliminated Commedia masks and also created wonderful roles for women, especially in The Mistress of the Inn in 1753. It is very difficult to reconstruct acting methods for 18th century theater, but several things are clear. Actors performed in front of, not inside, the changeable Italian scenery. Many theaters had a generous apron downstage at the proscenium arch, and it was on this open apron that most of the performance took place. Theaters were becoming quite large, with the result that actors needed to have great vocal facility. The gestures were probably quite expansive also. Actors often attempted to make very direct contact with the audience rather than interact directly with other actors, at least as the norm. This style of performance is often described as rhetorical acting. A stand-up actress or actress whose big voice and grand gestures were intended to capture the attention and admiration of a fully lit and social audience. Professional acting companies first came to North America from England in the 18th century. Professional theater here is usually dated from 1745 in Jamaica and 1752 in Virginia, when first one and later several acting companies toured the colonies. Amateur th theater in English, however, appeared occasionally in North America from 1665 onward from South Carolina to New York. New England prohibited the theater for many years under its Puritan leadership. Amateur theater appeared in French... Uh, in Canada in the 17th century and in Spanish in the Southwest even earlier. Mexico had active theater based on the Spanish um, models from the 1500s and had practicing local playwrights, some of whom date to the late 1500s. Of course, Native American ritual and storytelling reenactments and theatrical activity through the Americas predate all of the European-inspired theater. As Europe and its colonies reveled in discoveries of the New World and rediscovered the glories of the Western classical past, they hurried to shuck off the, uh, off the sensibilities of the medieval world and express an enlightened attitude. 
In their Renaissance and post-Renaissance plays, whether it was through neoclassical idealism or comparatively free-form mixed-tone dramas devised by Spanish and Elizabethans, European theater artists were simultaneously looking back at the Western classics and forward to a new world of exploration, discovery, and nationalistic zeal. Okay, so while you are listening to this, I am gone, cruising. Um, so good. You listened to the lecture, and um, you guys are reading Midsummer Night's Dream this week and answering the discussion questions that are due on Thursday. I will um, have access to my computer probably Monday. Let me look at it. Monday the 19th. So, um, you know, have a good week, and I will um, I will hear from you um, in grade discussion posts on um Monday the 19th. Okay, they stop.